Our first speaker is Dr. Sandy Tsao. She is a specialist in dermatology at the Mass General, and her talk today is entitled, Keeping Skin Healthy as the Clock Ticks. Thanks so much, Sandy. Thank you so much. And I really want to say thank you to Dr. Schifrin and the uh, Vincent Group and our Midlife Health Group. They're fantastic. It's great to see so many of you here this sunny day when a dermatologist actually starts to smile and panic looking to see where the sunscreen is. But, but we're all here and it's all good. So uh, happy to have you join me today. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, skin. I think I'm going to actually use our... So this, is a, this might be a typical day for me, patients coming in to see me in my clinic, and um, I'd like to show this photo because we come from so many backgrounds, we come from so many experiences, and as we age, each of us will have a different experience as far as exposures and um, different uh, th uh, things that are posed to us in our lifetime, and so as we think about our skin, we have to kind of individualize it, think about who we are, what we've done, and how we can not only make sure that our skin stays healthy, but how uh, as well to uh, continue to actually keep it nice and healthy. Well, our skin ages in response to many things. Um, the first thing we always worry about is sun exposure. And um, even in the wintertime, if any of you are skiers and you've ever had the raccoon eyes, you know you get snow reflected uh, light um, just with uh, even within a half an hour, 10 hours sun exposure. But we also have other changes happening to us. We have gravitational changes. We, we lose bony uh, and uh, muscular uh, structures and in time, we also lose some subcutaneous fat. Depending on how active we are, uh, we can also lose a lot of that uh, extrinsic fat as we age. And again, all together, they create who we are as we age. What causes sun damage is ultraviolet light. And uh, the two main types of the ultraviolet light that we worry about are ultraviolet A, UVA, and UVB. UVC are always mentioned, but they really don't penetrate, and so we really aren't affected by it unless you are a welder or work with sterilizing lamps. But these are very important lights. So why are we worried about it? Because they do cause sun damage. And they are um, the main cause of, of uh, our tanning, our pigmentary changes, a lot of our wrinkling, but most significantly precancers and cancerous lesions. And um, UVB rays are the the ones that actually, when we get a tan, that's what we see immediately when we go indoors. We go, oh, we got some color. That's UVB. And um, that is the main source of our sun damage and our skin cancer risk. And um, it is a, a superficial penetrating light, but it definitely gets to us as our ozone changes. We're getting much more of it. And it has been linked to some genetic mutated changes. But in, what's important for us to understand is that the more that we get, the more that it affects us. So in dermatology, I always like to tell my patients that um, it's really how many blistering sunburns you get is the worst and then non-blistering sunburns and cumulative sun. So we're never too early or never too late to actually protect our skin as far as using sunscreen and sun avoidance techniques that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, because again, we like to avoid some of the changes that develop as far as precancerous and cancerous lesions. Um, this is, no one likes to see me in August because this is what, this is the patient that comes in and goes, I know I shouldn't have gone to the beach before I saw, I saw Dr. Sal, but a very classic example of a sunburn. And again, um, definitely cumulative and um, something that we worry a lot about because this actually tells me that we've had um, some significant sun damage. UVA is what we worry about um, when we get into our car. It's the light that it penetrates the easiest onto our skin and it penetrates the deepest um, into our skin. And so even though it's not the uh, most significant light that penetrates to it, it's what we're really exposed to day in and day out. And even though it's not uh, what we see immediately after it, it's really what creates the sun. And again, uh, with UVB, a lot of the photo uh, associated aging. And here's an example of someone who had a lot of UVA, used their bathing suit, and, and you can see what a perfect example of if this person had put some sunscreen wouldn't have this, uh, what I don't think is a very nice tan, but someone might like to. What we worry about is honestly this. This is a patient who's definitely weathered a little bit too much sun, and these are some of the findings that we see. Uh, this patient actually has a lot of dispigmentation. I talk about uh, discoloration, little brown spots on the face, a lot of wrinkling, kind of a yellowing color to her skin, some wrinkles, and there's a scar on her nose that's indicative to me that she's actually had likely a skin cancer removed in the past. So this is what happens when we have extensive sun exposure. 
And um, where do we get the sun exposure? We always think about the beach. We always think of going about Turks and Caicos. Um, you know, dermatologists, for example, always have their meetings in sunny places. It's kind of a funny thing. I've never quite understood that. But that's actually the most common source, tanning beds. Tanning beds now in Massachusetts have actually, um, you have to be over the age of 18 to go to a tanning bed in Massachusetts, which is such a coup for us in dermatology because it's actually one of the highest concentrated amounts of UVA at one time that one can receive. And so you're really giving yourself an incredible dose of uh, sun exposure in a 15-minute in a, in a exposure. And uh, the CDC actually has labeled tanning beds as causally linked directly to the formation of melanoma skin cancer. So that's a pretty big thing to say. But I actually think, and I worry more about my patients walking to work or my son in school putting on his sunscreen or in the sport. So we get sun throughout the day. So just because we go to and from our car or to and for work does not mean that we're not getting any sun exposure. Uh, we also can be taking medications. It's very important to talk to your physicians regarding the possibility of some of the medications we take that make us more sensitive to the sun and um, really try to uh, try to avoid these medications. And oftentimes there are pre-existing medical conditions that pre uh, predispose us to developing um, uh, photo damage or being more susceptible to sunburns. So certainly we have to think about who we are in general. So how do we protect ourselves? This is the greatest question. Me sitting on the soccer field four hours a day with my son on a Saturday and Sunday, you know, sitting there getting in the beaded down sun. And you, my husband's also a dermatologist. He wears a hat. He has the gloves. He has everything down. And uh, you, would, you can always spot a dermatologist in the audience. But uh, so he, he actually and I were just sitting there thinking, this is insane. You know, we're completely exposed and kids have no sun protection. So um, shade is actually very helpful. And it, and the, it really um, staying uh, under an umbrella, wearing a hat, wearing clothing, definitely you're shading your skin. It does not actually allow us to skip the uh, addition of a sunscreen, but definitely is very helpful. And um, really trying to stay in those shady areas between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. where we have our greatest sun exposure is really very critical um, to avoid the sun. I love um, some protective clothing because I do like to be outside. We don't want you to live in a shelter. You know, you need to get outside. And I think one of the greatest boons that we've had in the uh, industry, clothing industry is the development of UPF, protective clothing. And it's sun protective clothing, usually with a number of 40 or 50 plus. And there are many companies. It can be simple as REI, Lands End, L.O. Bean. There are a couple of other very um, specialized companies called Kulu Bar and Salumbra that actually sell very glamorous, not so, so, uh, so uh, old-fashioned clothing lines that really help to protect your skin. And they're, they're actually wonderful to see now anywhere I go, so many people wearing these protective items. You have do have to wear, uh, be aware after a certain amount of time that some protective nature wears it out after probably a good six to ten launderings of the clothing. So you do have to rebuy it. But uh, again, definitely worthwhile. And I think the hat is a wonderful thing to look at because wearing a baseball hat is actually not very protective. Um, it's a little bit, but it only gives a little rim. You need to have actually a full rim hat and it needs to cover the back of our neck. And the most important part about that is that if you can hold up a hat and see light through it, it's certainly going through. So you want to have have a hat that actually does not have light penetrating to it and it covers your ears, your um, scalp, and the back of your neck because as we get older, we certainly know that some of us, uh, including myself, start to notice a little bit more thinning in areas that, where they were not exposed before. If you're not a big fan of wearing um, sun protective clothing, there is something that you can buy called SunGuard that is uh, sponsored by Ritz. They used to, old fashioned, I'm sold. Uh, many of you probably don't even know what it is, but it was a dye for the clothing you put into your laundry and it actually would color your clothes. Well, they actually actually make a sun guard that you put into your laundry, does not damage your clothing. It can well, uh, be uh, where it's effective whether or not your clothing is wet or dry, and it lasts uh, for a number of washings, and it actually gives you each of the clothing items uh, some protective clothing if you want, you prefer to wear your own clothing. You have to go on Amazon or drugstore.com to find something like this, but certainly worth thinking about when you do it. And my biggest question I get asked every day is, what do I do about sunscreen? Doctor, does an SPF 50 really work? I hear that it's hype. Well, you know, um, we got to get the sunscreen on. 
that's the basic nature of, of what we need to do. And certainly, um, I think that uh, it's not as spectacular going from an SP of 30 to an SP of 45 versus an SP of 15 to a 30, but incrementally, it does make a difference. So an SP of 15 provides at least a uh, filtering of about 93% of the ultraviolet B rays. Going to an SP of 30, you inch it up to 97%. So that's significant to me. And I actually use an SP of 85 to 100, even though I walk outside and I get an instant tan. And so for me, I know when I don't have that tan that I'm actually protecting my skin. And so it's it's uh, important to basically find a sunscreen. Uh, the American Academy of Dermatology actually recommends a minimum of SP of 30. And I think the biggest concern is the reapplication. I actually don't uh, always remember to reapply it, but it does exponentially break down very, very specifically over a period of two hours. So it needs to be reapplied every two hours if you're out into the sun. And broad spectrum is what we're looking for. We're looking to try to get that UVA, UVB coverage. Those are really important as far as making sure they're recovering ground for all of the potential light uh, damage that we may have. Well, I have a lot of patients and I understand the concern regarding chemical use in sunscreens. And um, I think that, uh, again, the industry has supplied us with wonderful products that are physical blockers. Those are your titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And those are very great physical blockers. They basically absorb the light and reflect it. So it doesn't get absorbed into your skin. And um, um, the, the old adage of seeing the um, the um, lifeguard with the white nose no longer exists. They make non-tinted zinc oxide and titanium dioxide products. Um, and so definitely worth looking for the product again that has UVA and UVB coverage. And um, the micronized forms are a little bit more elegant again so that you don't feel like you're walking around all day with a little white sheen to your skin. And so just a quick thing. So people say, how much do I put on? Well, if you buy a six-ounce six uh, sunscreen bottle, that is worth six applications. So we compare it to a shot glass. You need one ounce of sunscreen to cover your entire torso. And so you need a lot. It's not a little, let me get one bit and go like this and pat it down. No, that doesn't work. We need You need to put it on, you need to coat, and you need to make sure it's on. I don't mind the sprays, but the sprays can't be this, as I see a lot of people doing. Uh, you know, well, you know, it may be helpful if your sons and daughters are running away, and I understand I have two sons of my own and you're trying to capture them, but you spray it onto yourself and rub it onto your body, okay? Because you need to cover the surface area uniformly to make sure that you're actually getting adequate coverage uh, onto the skin. In 2012, actually, um, there was a regulated uh, ruling to actually make sure that there's a standardization of the sunscreen use, and that's really helpful. And we're seeing less and less SPF 2 to SPF 100. They're making it more SPF 30 to 50, you know, and they can't really promise a lot of things that aren't true, which is really nice as well, because it is, it, I get overwhelmed. I love shopping in the drugstores and looking at all the products. It's, I'm like a kid in the candy store, but, you know, when I see 15 sunscreens and I'm trying to figure out which one I want. UVA, UVB coverage, and uh, at least an SPF 30. That's basically what you need in a nutshell for your sunscreen. And so um, artificial tanners, people ask me about. They say, are these worth it? Uh, do they protect me from the sun? They don't harm your skin. It's like a tarnish. You're basically putting a superficial tarnish. You have a top layer of your skin called the stratum corneum, and you're just staining it. So, you know, it's fine. I can actually tell when someone uses a self-tanner, which is great because I know that they're not tan, but most of us, we wouldn't. So they're very, very uh, uh, effective in giving us the bronzing color that we like without exposing our skin to the sun or damaging aspects of it. Remember that they do not provide any sun protection. They are not a substitute for your sunscreen. So very important to um, apply your sunscreen on top of those artificial tanning agents. So people come to see me all the time. I have the best job in the world because I really try to make people better in such a great way. The skin is the biggest organ. I have a really big, you know, uh, area to actually help to make people better. But the most important for me is really un uh, managing medically what we see as potential uh, side effects of our past sun exposure as well as any surgical interventions that we need to See, I'd love to show this photo because this woman came in with this non-healing little scary, scaly air patch on her skin. And for me, that's a precancerous lesion. And um, I decided to treat her with a topical anti-chemotherapeutic agent. And what's amazing to us is, I don't know if you can see it very well with the lights on, but there are two little crusted areas here. But look what lit up. So her entire 
right forehead lit up. That's all photo damage. And that was potential for sun, sun damage and skin cancer. And so the good aspect of it is not only did I treat the pre-existing uh, precancerous lesions, but pre hopefully prevented some further changes as time goes on. So it isn't exactly what we see necessarily that's going to cause this damage. There's also underlying changes that we need to be aware of. And so um, this is one of the examples that we treat. I have to show, I'm a dermatologist, we always have to show gross some pictures. Every day my son is like, Mom, really? Um, but um, these are really important photographs because there are skin cancers that are so common and, and do affect us every day. And um, on the uh, on your left-hand side is a basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of skin cancer, very important for us to recognize. And the lower um, right side of the screen is a squamous cell carcinoma. The reason I like to show these photos is that I like to educate people if something isn't healing, come and see someone. See your primary care doctor, see your dermatologist, see someone. Because it may indicate that there's something concerning regarding that lesion, or if it bleeds, or it's changing color. And more in particular is something like this. A gentleman comes in, um, for another spot. This is a melanoma. This is our most uh, uh, worrisome skin cancer. And um, multicolored, many changes. Um, patient didn't even realize he thought it was just a regular mole. And so, you know, from us, I think it, we, I love to rely on my colleagues. They're wonderful. They do such great checks and, and often refer into us. And uh, I have to tell you, my, my patients are fantastic. They'll come in and self-report so many things. And uh, spouses who have married uh, their spouses because they recognize the growth on their back that was a skin cancer. Great stories that we have. <laughs> as far as what we do, but really important. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'm going to see my dermatologist in four months. Let me see her then. No, give a call, you know, and have someone look at it, um, um, you know, within the week or so to make sure that everything is, is okay. So um, we have an adage. We use the ABCDE. We love to look to make sure that moles are symmetric in their color and shape. You need to look at your mole, and if you can bisect it in half and have both sides look pretty equal, likelihood is it is okay. If it has a color change, it's irregularly elevated, developing a tail off of it, it may be worth having someone look at and make sure that it is actually okay. So what else do we have that bothers our skin and helps us to age? Well, I think I was most um, amazed at the fact that, you know, going through my own uh, premenopausal changes, uh, it's very interesting when you start to lose estrogen. Okay, estrogen is such an incredible important hormone for us regarding our skin, lubrication, and so many other issues, but I'm dealing just with the skin here. And when we have that uh, slowly uh, decrease in amount, it becomes uh, very noticeable as dry skin. And so many of my patients would come in and say, here I am, and my skin's very dry. So as we get older, it's really important that we replace any of that lost lipids with emollient use. Any type of lotion that we place on our skin at least once or twice daily is very critical to really helping to maintain nice, uh, healthy, uh, non-dry skin. And um, one of the things that I've always been very amazed at, too, is that um, we're always big fans of helping people stop smoking. Um, we know the many issues regarding smoking regard systemically, but for the skin, the those changes are not reversible when we stop smoking. And so um, it's something that as, as much as we need to know, those changes really do add to a lot of the um, changes that we see as we get older. Well, um, I'm always amazed. This is the Presley girls. So that is uh, Priscilla Presley, if any of you are old enough to know, Elvis Presley's wife. Um, and this is daughter Lisa and the male girls, the granddaughter. They all look alike. It's kind of scary. This was a photograph. <laughs> this was a photograph, probably a good, you know, 10, uh, excuse me, uh, what is it, uh, 2000, yeah, 13 years ago. And um, for me, I think that, you know, sometimes we have to think about there is a natural aging process. And, you know, I'm not in Hollywood, and uh, thank goodness I'm not. Um, you know, it's a very difficult uh, pressure to actually have a certain perspective. But, there, you know, this does go to show that you can continue to look great, um, you know, with some very simple observations. We can go too far. And uh, Joan Rivers, uh, God bless her, wonderful comedian, wonderful person, uh, but very open about a lot of the cosmetic procedures that she had, as well as this other woman um, who is very uh, has been um, called the lioness woman because she's had so many um, changes. I actually once saw her in New York City uh, and saw her having um, lunch with her daughter. It was stunning. And if you go back and look at the articles on her, so was she, and fell prey really to a lot of cosmetic uh, temptations that uh, can actually happen. I also like to show that when we do things to our face, we actually still 
have a neck and the rest of the torso. And so we need to be careful because we don't want to look perfect here and, you know, not match. And so, you know, I think that's one of the perspectives I have when we think about doing things for photo aging is really taking a look at that. But when my patients come in and they're looking to actually look better, get some rid of some of the photo aged aspects of our skin, I really emphasize the need to really do not only the sunscreen, which we've talked about, but put a lotion on every day, twice a day. That lotion would be uh, wonderful if it can have the addition of a gentle exfoliating agent such as an alpha hydroxy acid, glycolic acid. And they're really, really quite wonderful. And retinoic acid, which is usually a prescription, though if you have dry skin and over-the-counter version works beautifully, that is what you need to do every day. And that's like a basics. That is your basis for um, normal daily skin care, really to help take care of yourself. If you want a little additional um, over-the-counter care, vitamin C has actually been proven at a molecular level to actually work as a great antioxidant in conjunction with B, uh, vitamin B5. Um, if you go to your Sephora or similar department stores, they oftentimes will sell a product like SkinCeuticals or another product that they, you need to buy two little, little bottles of. I'm not usually big on serums, but vitamin C, vitamin B5, terrific. Yeah, we're definitely worth the using. And this is just a photo to show. You know, I do laser surgery. That's what I do all day. I have 25 devices. I'd love to use them. But, you know, if someone actually showed me a photo of this and I would have an audience of my colleagues saying, oh, that was this device, that device, this is Retin-A. Three months of Retin-A, topically around the eyes for crow's feet. Absolutely great. So, you know, very basic, four basic skincare things to do your skin can really make such a difference in wrinkling and uh, reduction of brown spots. Um, Neotensil was a great product that was introduced by our Wellman Laboratories in conjunction with some folks over at MIT. Um, and now it just came out as second skin. It was all over the news yesterday for pulling the skin and getting rid of wrinkles. And so, gosh, I'm always, I'm always up for an instant fix. I don't think life is always that simple. But, you know, if you have an important event you're looking to try to do, um, we, we look for these kind of products. So I do have a lot of patients who come in and they say, gosh, you know, I do have these lines. I'd really like to improve them. And uh, we do have means and methods of making better. Uh, this is a patient who actually had very prominent frown lines uh, and with the use of a botulinum toxin injection softens. We can do the same thing for foreheads and uh, we also do the same for, thing for crow's feet. And, you know, honestly, it makes such a difference There's so many people as we get older, we're trying to actually uh, be competitive in the marketplace. I have a lot of, when not only women but men come in and they're saying gosh I'm 55 I'm pretty smart you know but I have the 23 year old who looks a lot better and you know very simple very straightforward easy things that can be done to make the skin look a little bit better um, are truly truly wonderful advantages in that situation um, we also have used it to soften wrinkles around the mouth I've used it for puckering when we get older you get a little dimpling and I've used it for neck bands when we have our, our you remember we still age from here and here so to make the neck look a little bit better I think one of the blessings that we have at MGH and this is a funny slide to show you other than all we think about is wavelengths of light and lasers and at what the Wellman laboratories and dermatology and what a blessing it's been because they have made such amazing contributions for the laser treatment management of so many medical conditions that I feel is such a blessing to be a part of that group. But um, in one of the instances that we do is we take advantage of different chromophores on our skin. Uh, we have fat, water, we have blood vessels, and we have pigments in our skin. And what we do is, as you saw some of the photo age photos that I've been showing you, you have pigment, vessels, wrinkles, all, all of which are targets for us to reduce. And so using lasers to help to reduce some of the wrinkling, this is, a, is really very helpful. This is a patient who didn't really have a lot of brown spots but had some wrinkling. She said, I want to do one thing in my life. That's what I want to do. We did a, a, an ablative laser resurfacing of her skin. She had nice arching. She had lifting. It was almost as if we did a facelift arched her brows, did some Povitex. No, we just did the laser treatment. And that is a benefit that's going to probably last her between five to eight years. Very straightforward. Um, we don't have to do full face. We do very uh, localized areas. These are some of the most difficult wrinkles for me to manage other than with a laser, but you can see that they smooth out beautifully and really can make quite a difference for our patient. Again, I'm a big advocate of going down and seeing that the rest of the body is aging, so you can really improve neck lines, discolorations, and such with a lot of our lasers. I think the one thing to take home is that how much do we do? You know, we want to age gracefully. You know, you don't want to look 35 when you're 62. You know, it's just not a good thing. So I love to show this photo because this is a wonderful woman who uh, came to see me for treatment. She brought her granddaughter and said, this is how I want to look. And I said, me too. You know, so I said, boy, that's my ultimate challenge. But um, 
no, we aren't going to. We are not going to be able to do that. But I said <laughs> we. But we can absolutely make you look wonderful for your age, right? And so that's the take-home message with uh, the pursuit of uh, improvement with uh, lasers and light is that we will make better. But she really doesn't. Things have downtime. This is a gruesome picture. But you know, you have to ask your treated treatment doctors how much time it's going to take to heal. I think that's a big thing when we're busy in our lives and we don't have a lot of downtime. Is what's going to happen to us? But I want to show you just a series of photos. This is a nice woman who was a little bit younger, had definitely been a lifeguard, a little bit of weathering, but just with a single, very, very light laser treatment, had some nice improvement of her skin. As we get a little bit older, a little bit more pigment, a little bit more wrinkles, a little more aggressive laser, beautiful smooth skin. And um, it does erase a lot of the precancerous lesions. It actually does erase a lot of time. This is a little with a little more laxity. And it's almost as if, as if we did a surgery of her eyes because we've actually tightened all her skin around her eyes. And that's why I love this photo so much is erase those lines. And it's not with constant fillers and Botox and other treatments, a single laser treatment that really is very helpful and beneficial. And we work to get rid of melasma, which is a pigmentary, pigmentary condition that is very bothersome to patients. And um, also really just try to, again, improve uh, hands, uh, necks, and other regions. And I'm just going to move on a little bit because I'm running out of time. But, you know, some people don't want to have laser treatments. They want to just exfoliate. And so we use chemical peels to help make better. And you can see this patient's pretty photo damaged. And um, that's her skin about six months after. And, you know, we've done a, we've erased about 10 years of some bad sun exposure for her in one fell swoop. A gentleman with a little bit more extensive melasma, he was, afraid, he was ready to quit his job because people were making so much fun of him because he had pigmentation of his face. We did a series of very strong chemical peels, and it's really lightened, and it's stuck where his wife became a patient because look, he looked younger now, and so they were in competition for looking good. There is no instant fix with cosmetics. You know, patients come in and come in with tubes of things to swell their lips up. That's caffeine or capsaicin or a combination of the two. And yes, you look kind of, you look very Kardashian, no connection, um, but, you know, not fair and doesn't last. We, we don't really know how to replace collagen yet, uh, but we're trying. And so we oftentimes fill in spots in these areas that I'm indicated by the arrows um, to make one look younger. And um, I think they work nicely you know, so that you don't feel like you have marionette lines or uh, a lot of atrophy. And I think it, they make such a difference in, in how you appear. This is a woman who was medically very uh, n uh, not well and could not do a lot of surgical procedures, so we did some fillers. And this was her three years later, and I think she held up nicely to um, a lot of filler uh, treatment. I treat hands because I just had a woman come in the other day. She said, gosh, I look great here, but everybody keeps telling me, what about my hands? And we do fillers for that, and they look great. So, you know, there are many, many treatments that we can um, have available to us, getting with the capillaries, because I'm tired of people telling me I'm an alcoholic. You know, no, you're not. You have capillaries from rosacea or from some, sun, some old sun exposure, and let's erase them. You know, it's very straightforward and easy to do. If you're not a, uh, a, a procedure person, use a tint, use a color. Easy. You can find all these great things to do. So uh, we get rid of fat. This is one of my favorite things to do. We're freezing fat. We're heating fat. We're getting rid of things. So you still have to exercise. You still have to take your skin. But if it's there, you know, very good things to do. Or we can lift with, with strings and barbs. So, so many fun things. Uh, people always ask me about home um, uh, rejuvenating devices. They haven't been FDA studied well. Um, you know, they may provide a little bit of benefit. You could probably do well with a little gentle exfoliating your skin and a good four-point four daily care regimen. Now, I don't know if I'd spend any extra money. So um, the uh, take-home point here is that um, it's definitely important to apply uh, sunscreen daily, all year long, every two hours. Um, definitely think about uh, avoiding sun exposure as you can. Avoid the sun if you're taking any photosensitizing meds. Use your sun protective clothing. Do home skin checks. I like to say when you're doing your press examination, your press, your, uh, your other uh, uh, skin checks, uh, do that once monthly. Get your yearly skin check with your primary care doctor or a dermatologist if it's as, as appropriate. And remember when the darn of winter, and you're saying, I need to go to Turks and Caicos, okay? We don't want that. You know, we don't want this. Too much treatment, not a good thing, okay? And it's nice to age gracefully. This is, a, you know, it's just wonderful. And um, I hope that we all do and enjoy things. Uh, the rest of the day, I hope, is a great one for you. Thank you very much for your time.